What a time to be studying Jonah, especially when the subtitle is Navigating a Life Interrupted. But that's just exactly what our Tuesday evening Bible study is studying right now. In fact, the first night of our study was the very day that Monty and Mary Lou received a call asking them to prayerfully consider going to Artesia to minister. Monty and Mary Lou's life was interrupted. A couple of weeks later, our life as a church family was interrupted. I hope that we can learn a couple of things from Jonah this morning as I share a little bit with you from our Bible study. Matt read the first chapter of Jonah for us. It's a familiar story. Jonah's life was interrupted. Now, we know that Jonah ran away from God. We know that he was disobedient. But before we're too hard on Jonah, let's remember a little bit of our Bible history of that day. Jonah lived in a time of national economic prosperity. Israel had regained lots of their lost territories. They had achieved their most prosperous time since King Solomon. Israel, their wealth had exploded because they controlled uh, trade routes through Palestine, which connected the ancient world. Jonah was just one of many prophets that lived in the northern kingdom of Israel. That was his job. His job was to be a prophet. He had three main priorities in his life. The first one was to hear the word of God. The second one was, once he heard that word, take it, proclaim it to his people, the Israelites. And then, of course, he was, it was important to him to be identified as a true prophet of the living God. More than likely, Jonah was popular. He was highly respected. He was appreciated. We know that he was financially well-to-do and taken care of. God interrupted Jonah's life. Nineveh was one of the largest provinces in Assyria. They had a reputation for just wrecking havoc and terror on all of their enemies, both physical and psychological. And their enemies included Israel. It's really not a surprise that even at the mention of their name, Jonah was filled with bitterness he was filled with dread. He was filled with fear. Some scholars believe that Jonah may have even lost close relatives at the wrath of the Ninevites. So really, is it any wonder that he turned tail and ran? He probably even thought he wasn't getting the right word from God. Surely you didn't say Nineveh, God. Surely you don't want me to go to those heathens. So he turned tail and ran. But he didn't get away with it, did he? The Lord provided a fierce storm. The Lord provided a big fish. Jonah acknowledged his disobedience. He took responsibility for his disobedience. Later, the Lord provides a vine to shelter Jonah a worm to eat up the vine. The Lord was really even behind the Ninevites turning back to him. But Jonah's life was interrupted. He survived three days in the belly of that big fish, and then he wound up right back where he had started. He realized that the word he had heard was the word God wanted him to hear. He realized that 
he was to go to Nineveh. And so, by putting one foot in front of the other, he traveled 500 miles to Nineveh to give the Ninevites the word the Lord had given him. It was a simple message. The message was, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned. Jonah walked into the city. He began declaring this message. And believe it or not, the Ninevites believed the word of the Lord coming from Jonah. They turned from their sin. They repented. They wore sackcloth and put ashes on their heads and came back to God. Now, as we read the story of Jonah, our impression is that Jonah is the main character in that story. But really and truly, the main character in the story is God. The story opens with the word of the Lord. Here again, Jonah 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Then the story itself centers around the acts of the Lord. The storm, the big fish, the plant, the worm. As we said before, even the Ninevites turning back to God. And then the story concludes with the word of the Lord. Listen to Jonah 4 verses 9 through 11. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, Jonah said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Now, what can we learn from this story? Remember that God is the primary character in the story of Jonah. He's also the primary character in our story as a church family. God's plans for us may be completely beyond what we can imagine or what we want. Our feelings may hinder our ability to reason, but our feelings cannot be the determining factor in our choosing obedience making sense of what God has asked of us, or feeling compelled to cooperate with him can't be the prerequisites for our choosing obedience to what God has asked us to do. His word, the Bible, has to be enough for us. Listen to Proverbs 3, verse 5, as expressed in the Amplified Bible. It says, lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all of your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight and understanding. His word has to be enough for us. Monty and Mary Lou have led us well. They've loved us. They still love us. They have taught us about the power of the Holy Spirit. They've been here for us. They've shown us the value of a spirit-filled life. We don't want them to leave. We're mad at Richard in the cabinet for daring to put us in this position. How could they? We don't want somebody new. She's cute, but she's a woman. Everybody knows women aren't preachers, right? <laughs> uh, 
But here's where God says, I'm calling the shots here. Let's think about and remember Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God is saying to us as a church family, all I need is for you to step out in faith, in trust, in obedience, and join me in my work. Now back to our Bible study for a minute. Priscilla Shire is the author and teacher of this study, and she gave us a couple of equations in the very beginning of the study that really um, can teach us a lot. The first one was insignificant people plus an insignificant task equals an interruption. But the next one was significant people plus a significant task equals divine intervention. Think about it for a minute. We're significant people. Any task that God gives us is a significant task. So when it comes to our relationship with God, we're able to redefine interruption into divine intervention. Monty and Mary Lou's life was interrupted. Our life has been interrupted. But with God in our lives, those interruptions have become divine interventions. And remember that a life interrupted by God is a privileged life. Our God expects us to meet his challenges with hope in him, with trust in him, and with obedience to him. And then guess what? Priscilla Shire says that with our hearts open to God's leading, he gives us promises. The first promise that he gives us is that he will be with us every step of the way. There are many, many scriptures in the Bible that tell us this, but I've chosen a few to share with you this morning. The first one is from Isaiah 41, verse 10. It reads, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then in Matthew 1, verse 23, even one of Jesus' names gives us this promise of God's presence with us. It reads, The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means... God with us. How about Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20? Jesus says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely... I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And one more in Hebrews, Hebrews 13, the last part of verse 5. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. God promises to be with us every step of the way. Second, God promises us an exceedingly great opportunity. God can make the impossible possible. We know that. We know that nothing is impossible with God or for him. John 14 verse 12 quotes Jesus. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing 
he will do even greater things than these. So God promises us exceedingly great opportunities. Third, God promises us a divine anointing. When we are obedient to God and to his anointing or his favor is on us, we can expect huge things. I love this quote from Priscilla. Small obedience sprinkled with God's divine anointing will yield more results than big obedience without the presence of God upon it. Listen to how 1 John 2 verses 26 and 27 state this promise in the message. I've written to warn you about those trying to deceive you, but they are no match for what is embedded deeply within you, Christ anointing no less. You don't need any of their teaching. Christ anointing teaches you the truth on everything you need to know about yourself and about him, God. And last but certainly not least, by following God and being obedient to him, he promises us supernatural results. Let's go back and look at that John 14, verse 12 chap, uh, verse again, where Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. And Jesus was the master of supernatural results, was he not? God gives us that promise, too, as followers of him. One other verse that I would like for us to think about and hear as we prepare for the changes that are ahead of us in the next weeks is from 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 7. You know, this is Paul writing to the Corinthians. And in these particular verses, he's addressing them because they've been arguing among themselves. They've been saying, some of them say, oh, well, I follow Paul after all. He was the first one here and he brought us the word and, and I follow Paul. And some of the others in the church were saying, oh, but Apollos is a great preacher, and he, he just brings such a good message every week. It's just wonderful. I follow Apollos. And so here's what Paul says to the church at Corinth. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. I hope you'll go home today and read the entire book of Jonah. It's not long. It's a great story. You'll see that Jonah was never really happy not only with his marching orders, but with the outcome. God used him anyway. And I hope when you read that story, you'll think about how God works in our world, how he's working in our midst now, and then thank him for his divine intervention in our lives. Father, we come to you this morning asking for your strength, your guidance, your continued love to take us where we need to go, to be the people we need to be, to live the lives that you would have us live in order to glorify your name. It is in the name of your precious Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we ask these things. Amen.